Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum presents a Q&A with Michael Apted, acclaimed filmmaker of the beloved cinematic experiment, The Up Series, on the opening night of 63 Up, its ninth installment on November 27th. The series began with 7-Up in 1964, which introduced the group of British seven-year-olds that the series has followed, with a new film release checking in with them every seven years since. Film Forum is proud to have hosted the U.S. premiere of most of the films in the series, including the first theatrical release in the U.S. of an Up installment, 28-Up in 1985. Apted was joined for the Q&A by the series' longtime director of photography, George Jesse Turner, and editor Kim Horton. The Q&A was moderated by Film Forum's premieres programmer, Mike Majore. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Film Forum. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Mike Majore. I program the premieres at Film Forum with director Karen Cooper. And I'm very proud to welcome you to the U.S. theatrical premiere of 63 Up, the latest installment of Michael Apted's decades-spanning documentary series following a group of British children since the age of seven. This is an extraordinary project uh, filming characters over the course of 56 years. Uh, the late Roger Ebert called the series, quote, the noblest project in cinema history. And no another critic remarked that it's like, quote, watching human beings take shape before our eyes. We are delighted to have Michael Apted with us tonight. He has directed eight of the nine installments ever since 7 Plus 7 in 1970. He worked as a researcher on 7 Up which was made as a one-off for a TV series not unlike 60 Minutes called World in Action. He has shown an inspiring persistence and dexterity in seeing this project through with near complete participation from all of the original subjects. Uh, during this entire period, Apted has deftly moved between making non-up documentaries like Incident at Oglala and Moving the Mountain and to fiction features like Coal Miner's Daughter, Gorky Park, Thunderheart, and even a James Bond movie. Uh, we feel a unique connection to the series because I believe we were the first theater in the U.S. to play an episode theatrically. We opened 28 Up along with 7 Up in 1985. As an added surprise, we're fortunate to also have two of Apted's closest longtime collaborators, key shapers of this series, editor Kim Horton and director of photography George Jesse Turner. They have a combined 77 years of experience working on this series. Right now, I would like to introduce you to the distributor who has made it possible for us to show this film tonight, Ezra Ezzard from BritBox. Please welcome Ezra Ezzard. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ezra Ezzard. I'm here representing our BritBox team. Thank you for joining us tonight as we celebrate Michael Apted on opening night of the ninth installment of 63 Up. Um, as you know, BritBox is a streaming service owned by BBC and ITV with the largest collection of curated British content. And we are happy to be able to say that you will be able to watch the entire Up series exclusively on BritBox. So thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy. Please welcome the director of 63 Up, Michael Apted. Thank you very much. You know, and I want to bring on uh, two of your key collaborators on this project going back many, many years. Kim Horton, the editor of this series since 28 Up. Please come forward. And George Jesse Turner, director of photography since 21 Up. This is a bit like this is your life now, Michael. You know, there's so much affection for this series, and what you created is such a unique achievement. The first thing that springs to my mind after rewatching many of these episodes is the level of trust that has been placed in, in you and your team by these subjects. I mean, only one or two subjects have dropped out over the years since 1964. And I was wondering if you could just start by talking about your relationships with these subjects and how willing or unwilling some of them have been over the years to participate. Well, 
uh, on the whole, they were wonderful. From early days with it, it felt as though it was a joint effort. We've always had a good relation from the very beginning, which wasn't necessarily the, them doing everything I wanted them to do or whatever. But there was always a, a, a sort of a trust going on. There was no kind of tension particular going on between us. So, you know, we had our arguments and whatever, but I, I think that what I had to do was deliver whatever I promised them and not to break w words with them and whatever. Uh, and just because from the very beginning, I, I, I sort of knew this, we had a chance to keep this thing moving along. We were all of the right age when we started that we could keep going with it. And I didn't want to, uh, I, I didn't want to wreck that by some sort of childish behavior or whatever, or falling out with them. And so, you know, we, we lost a, a couple on the way when some went off and came back again. And, you know, we w lost one uh, through, you know, dying or whatever. But uh, in the end, I had to be kind of grown up about it. and see their point of view without trying to, you know, as it were, soften the whole thing out. But, but they understood and, uh, you know, they were part of it. And uh, also I would show them the film and, you know, if they had any really horrible thoughts about it, you know, then we would ac take action because, you know, was, I wanted this to be for the for for the long haul and not just one episodic thing after another. So uh, I, I did as much as I can, didn't we? We did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, k to keep them happy because that seemed to me to be uh, more important than, oh my goodness, look, they, they made some changes, how dare they do that. It was, I think we all felt that we wanted to go bend backwards if you want to deliver to keep them happy and to deliver what they wanted without without compromising it and turning the thing into you know, some ridiculous uh, requiem or whatever it is wow <laughs> what was that all about well there's been a and, and i think also there's been a continuity in terms of the creative Oh, yeah. team yeah, so that must have lent a mean certain confidence. I mean, George has been there since 21, and, th and I'm sure they see George showing up with Michael and uh, <laughs> the producer, uh, Claire Lewis, right, who's not here tonight, but has produced, I think, all the films since 28 Up. Yeah, and what's wrong with him? And, of course, Kim is the editor and has shaped these stories so skillfully, yes. uh, juggling so many different characters into... This, you know, riveting kind of, even though it's two and a half hours long, I think it moves very quickly through each yeah, character. Well, that is down to him. Isn't yeah. it, George? It certainly is. Yeah. He's had a hell of a job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, r with it, you, we, we have time constraints because we obviously add a new program every seven years and we have so much archive. And we do have to tell their life story before we get on to the new year that, that we're in. So there's a lot of stuff to put in. And we, we, we have some very popular bits of archive that you can't not put in. And in fact, we get complaints when from, from an audience to say, well, why didn't you put the dog eating the rabbit in the, in the Susie <laughs> section or... You know, and we have to live with that. I mean, there are occasions where we just haven't got the time to put it in. I have to say the quality of the footage in, of the previous episodes in 63 Up seems a lot higher than what is available right now on DVD. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, we, seven years ago, ITV actually paid uh, quite a lot of money to finally clean up a lot of the archive, and we went back to its original negative and they did a digital cleanup and scan. And, you know, lo and behold, that film stuff that you're seeing, you know, just looks a million dollars now, you know. And, that, and that's what can be done. But, but equally, we don't want to go too far with that sort of stuff. We don't want it to look... I know Michael was very concerned when we were doing it. We didn't want to make it look like tape, you know, video. Um, and I don't, I don't think we did. I mean, you know, I think it, it just looks brilliant now. 
Yeah, I mean, I think sitting in the back tonight and uh, one of the reasons Kim and I came here was actually to see it projected in front of a couple of hundred people. And uh, there's two things that I certainly will take away from tonight. First of all was the laughter of all of you over certain parts of it, which you don't get when you sit at home with two or three people. <laughs> so, because you don't. And that was great. Um, the, the bits that you expect people to laugh at, they did. Um, and I hope that when you watched it, you actually enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm not going to take all night telling you, but having been involved in the project for 42 years, um, of which I've probably filmed about 90% of what you've seen on the screen tonight, it's just interesting to see my work in a project that has become so important in history. It will never be repeated again, I don't think, because it's taken the time of change of how people are, the kind of equipment that we now use, um, and actually to see it the way it all goes together pretty seamlessly is very good and very satisfying for myself, but probably for Kim and anybody else that's been involved with the project. Who's he? Somebody that we've <laughs> known for a very long time, Michael. <laughs> I found the structure of this one interesting because you're, you start off with uh, Tony, who, to my mind, seems the most comfortable with the idea of being filmed and in this series. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I mean, he kind of, he saw everything coming. He said he wanted to be a jockey. He became a jockey. He wanted to be a cabbie. He's a cabbie. Mm -hmm. And then you end the film with Neil, who probably has the least predictable trajectory of any of the characters in this series. And I was just wondering how you, and maybe this is also a question for you, Kim, just how you decide to structure, because each episode is a little different in terms of the, the flow. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have, in the past, sort of bookended the, the, uh, the, the complete film with Tony and Neil. And w when we changed that dynamic, in fact, uh, last time round, we changed that dynamic, we ended on Tony. Well, there was a very good reason why we did that, but, but it wasn't quite the same. So it was good to return to the order that we've got. I mean, certainly it's kind of the, the structure. We do put a lot of thought in, into it. And, and you've got to remember that this was initially for three episodes of television. And we structured it sort of for television. You know, and there's, there's all sorts of stuff. You know, you've got three women and you want to sort of spread them over the over the program and you don't want all the all the posh boys in in one episode and lots of things like that so there is some thought put to it no, no i think we've usually s either started or finished with neil or if not with tony yeah that's correct they're, they're both very articulate and both you know and understandable and both vivid so we need to give some re energy to the to the film to, to start the film and uh, emotion to finish the film and i reckon that most of the, I, I haven't even checked it but uh, over, i don't know you know who have who have done the most openings to the film and who've done the most closing to the film well, I think those two. Those so two, yeah, yeah. So t Tony and and Neil have been openers and closers, really. Yeah. 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 And um, Michael, it seemed that uh, I mean one of the most emotional segments of this episode is is Nick, and his illness. I was wondering if you could talk about that interview. Yeah, I mean it was it was once we heard we were in Australia with the Australian lads, uh, and we heard that uh, Nick was near de death's door. And uh, it all happened very, very quickly. I mean, we were pe when we started shooting. I think it was say, say July of ninety of, of oh eight or whatever it is. So we went around our way, and suddenly we got an email from from him uh, to Claire saying that I was uh, I may not be able to do the show. I'm very, very sorry. And we were gobsmacked. We had no idea he was ill or would be anywhere near being ill as it were. So then, you know, we, we tried not to, we did whatever research we could about him to see how dangerously ill he was. But we couldn't really, we had to kind of carry on making the rest of the film. 
and we got to the end of it in Australia and then suddenly we got an email from him saying, yes, if you come here on January the 1st, uh, we can shoot for uh, you know a half an hour or something like that. So we made all our changes, uh, changed all our flights, and you know we all went to to um, Madison Square. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I was terrified, uh, and you know we hadn't heard anything from him. And then you know I was in the room where we were going to shoot it, and then suddenly we we heard little voices, and in he came, and he seemed fine. And, whatever, and I, I didn't quite know how to treat him as though he was, you know, near death, as, you know, we, we assumed he was, and, but anyway, I mean, he s sat down, uh, um, I only saw him as he, through the window of, of the room that we were in, and he, he looked all right, and, you know, we'd had all sorts of plans about how to do the interview, uh, and I felt it was important that we get to the the, the 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 crust of it very quickly in case he can't f do very much. So I had to do the interview. So by saying after about five minutes about how ill he was and, uh, and all this, and he talked talked about that, and he'd said to me before we started, look, um, I can probably do f five ten minutes at a st at a stint, uh, and then I probably will have to have rest. We started interviewing him, and an hour and a half later, we finished. <laughs> we, you couldn't stop him, and it was so moving, you know, uh, it makes us all cry to think about it. But he's still alive, and we, you know, we don't know how we get as many reports as we can, but he was always very game, a big lover of the series, and he, as much as any of them saw the importance of it and, and the possibilities of it, you know, and he always gave us his best and whatever. And, um, you know, we sort of just pray that he can stay alive and have some more life. We have time to take one or two questions from the audience. I noticed that each of the participants um, speak about the pain. I mean, there's various pains in their particular life, but the pain of doing this project and I just wondered if you could speak at all about what it was particular to being in this that was so challenging they loved it and they continued in it but it was a challenge for each of them it seemed and I wondered why you know I'd spoken to them all and uh, said you know we'll, we'll do what the, the, the prayer at the time and all this kind of stuff but once we started talking, it w all the anxiety went. I mean, there were one or two things they didn't want to discuss, and I always, you know, honoured that. So I think the thought of it the uh, was, was frightening to them, but the a execution of it wasn't, because I never changed my mind or threw, threw things at them, as it were, you know, in a mo whatever. But the actual doing of it, and with the, since you know, I've kept these guys with it as long as they can. I mean, they were seven years old when we started, but um, <laughs> but, but all the faces were familiar. Everybody knew what we had to do. Everybody was briefed about what problems there might be, so avoid that. So we made it as comfortable, and you know, we've known these, we've all known each other a hell of a long time. But I think the thought of it was frightening. I mean, to a certain degree, it was for me, not for these guys, because these are master craftsmen. <laughs> but um, no, I think that that was the thing they feared the worst. And they thought I might, you know, put a, an odd question in, which would be embarrassing, but I never did. I never went against my word. And so I think the actual execution of it was always you know, it's kind of warm and loving, and everybody was if affectionate with each other, everybody knew each other's single names and whatever. So, you know, that was the atmosphere of it. So we never really, really had any trouble when we started shooting. George, I mean, I think the pressure on you to get everything right, because I would imagine that you only have a limited amount of time with each of these subjects yeah i mean i think uh, michael has addressed the situation that 
the familiarity of having the crew around the same faces, um, the way that television is made today, even now you sometimes have two cameras. When we did it up until probably, fifth, uh, well, definitely up to 49, there was only ever one camera. And the art was to just have the minimum amount of equipment. So in fact, that if they said they wanted to sit in that chair, that's where we did it. I didn't mess about, move things around. Um, and so we tried to make them as relaxed as possible, which I think reflects in how it is. You know, today they would do it completely differently. And you know, when I work now, if I do work, um, the equipment that you use is more bulky and all the other kind of things. And I think just the style that we did and carried from way back when David Samuelson started filming when they did 7 Up in 64, I've tried to keep that continuity. Um, and I think, you know, it reflects that it is. But I have to say, the one thing, and Michael I know knows what I'm about to say, I think, that we were never allowed to ask any questions while we were setting up or whatever. Um, it, I think it would killed us if we did. Um, so we just would be very polite if they want to give you a cup of tea and we put the lights up. And then when Michael asked the questions, they'd never heard them before. As much as we would like to ask them, we would daren't do it. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but I just want to say, please keep going if you can. Please. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to BritBox for making this event possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent nonprofit cinema and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.